Chem 201, College Chemistry 1. Um, now we are with Chapter 5 about gases. As we can see in the table of contents, in here we will learn about the pressure, which is a parameter that we haven't learned yet. Uh, we use it in everyday life, but uh, here we will focus on the units. I'm sure for the ones that are driving, you're familiar with the pressure that your tires uh, need. Right? Same thing for the bike riders. Riders, you guys need a particular pressure for the ones that work with or basketball, volleyball, any specific balls. Also, there is an official pressure that your ball needs to right to fulfill in order to be a, in a competitive level. Same thing for the scuba divers, the ones that enjoy that. Definitely, we will cover also some topics about the pressure, volume, temperature, how are all these parameters that we have been studying so far. They all combine in gases. Gases is one of the most important states of the matter, not because of the importance in the sense that like in the, from the economical point of view, it is really important because like it is affected by so many parameters that um, that, that makes it way uh, very important. We will study some laws, uh, gas laws, the Boyle, Charles, Avogadro, um, here the book misses one, which is the Gay-Lussac. Gay-Lussac is another scientist that also works with, with gases. Uh, and I will touch briefly right here in, in when we see this particular laws of Boyle, Charles, and Avogadro. Ideal gas law, which is not, nothing else than the combination of all those laws, Boyle, Charles, and, and, and Avogadro, gas stoichiometry, Again, now we will see stoichiometry everywhere where we do in chemistry. Stoichiometry about quantities, but now applied to gases. The law of the partial, uh, partial pressures for Dalton, the same Dalton that we studied before. Remember about the fundamentals, uh, the atomic structure? At uh, the same Dalton, this scientist then focus on, on gases. And then we're going to be ending it with kinetic molecular theory of gases, how gases behave, what gases are so special, how uh, are they, how can we imagine gases inside of a tank. Then we will finish with real gases, because as here, as you see in this particular section 5.3, is about ideal gas law. So what makes a gas ideal and what makes a gas real? Okay? So <clears throat> there are some parameters to, to consider between ideal and real gases. And then characteristic of several real gases, we will see a new formula, which is the, the Van der Waals, right? Van der Waals uh, equation, which is the modified version for the ideal gas law. Okay, let's get started. So what is a gas, right? So this chapter is about gases. We have to know what is a gas. Gas, as, as from the very beginning, chapter one, we know that gas is one of the three states of the matter. I know, we know that it's also a fourth, which is the plasma. But if we are more conventional, gas could be the one that is um, is the lightest, right? So normally when you, you hear the, the word gas, you imagine something that floats, something that is really gassy, right? I mean, it has no, some, even some people might say that gases have no mass, but the gases actually have mass. And then it's normally um, it's underestimated, but I would say that it's one of the most abundant elements, right, that we have in nature. I mean, if you consider, imagine the planet, uh, the atmosphere, right, definitely is, is larger in size than the troposphere, which is the solid part of the, of the, even than the hydrosphere, which is the liquid part of the planet. Okay? So by definition, a gas, uh, uniformly uh, fills any container, uh, mixes completely with any, any other gas. And as we will see, uh, if we recall the very beginning, the difference, right? So if we go back to chapter one, what we call a solid, we will see that the particles of the solid, in this case, atoms of molecules, are very tightly packed, right? So all the atoms or molecules are very, close and then there is a lot of forces that are connecting all these elements right in the case of a liquid we have some flexibility so it's not as tight as what we have in a in a solid but but it's not as loose as what we will see in the gas phase in the gas phase we will see a gas like this okay? so that makes it for example that solids there is no effect basically in pressure 
there is no effect in volume, I cannot compress too much the, the, the solid part of this, right? So the solid, I cannot, even if I apply pressure, a piston, there is not much that I can do with a solid. With a liquid, pressure also doesn't affect it too much, right? So uh, if I apply pressure here, there is no much I can do to a liquid. In gas, you can do whatever you want with the gas. You can put it in this container, you can put it in a triangle, the triangle, now the gas will be in a triangle. If you put it in a sphere, now the gas will be a sphere. You can change the shape of a gas any way you want. And even I want to put it in a sphere as small as this. Yeah, you can put the gas in a sphere as small as that. So you can also change the, the volume and also the shape of a gas. Right? So just more or less to recall what we know from the very, right, from the very beginning. Mix it completely with any other gases, yeah. With gases, forget about solubility rules. Everything is soluble in the gas phase. Um, there is no polarity, things that make it different one substance to the other, no, they will always be uh, soluble. Exerts pressure in, in, on its surrounding, yes. So there is a pressure, something that we don't have in solids and liquids. Now, since the molecules freely move in the container, so, that velocity, right? Because remember, imagine the gas is like a lot of marbles. Imagine like a box that you have a lot of marbles, those glass marbles, you put it inside of a box and then try to shake it. You will see that the marbles are gonna be hitting the walls. That force, right? The intensity of that force of hitting the walls, that's what we call pressure in the case of gases, okay? Pressure by definition is, uh, is force over area. And it has different uh, units. So one of the, well, the SI, which is the stand um, international system, right? So uses the Pascal, that's the SI unit. But in normally in, in chemistry, we use what we call atmospheres of pressure. And then here you have the conversion factor, 101,325 1, Pascals. And another way is the atmosphere uh, versus millimeters of mercury, right? 700 and 760 millimeters of mercury, which is also equal to 764. Just to give you a brief about this, uh, this is really what Torricelli, right? That's why you see the unit here, Tor. What is this Tor? Tor is coming from the last name of the scientist. The scientist was called Torricelli. Torricelli did this experiment. This experiment consisted on a pool, well, it's a container, and then here he had mercury. Mercury, that poisonous metal that we know that is liquid. Mercury is in this pool. And then he put mercury and he put this, uh, he filled it up, also this test tube with mercury, and then he put it upside down. So when he put it upside down, uh, he noticed that some of the mercury moved down. So leaving this as vacuum. So <clears throat> then Torricelli was wondering like, why makes the mercury, why is not all the mercury coming out of the test tube, right? Because mercury has some density, it's a heavy metal. I mean, it definitely it's heavy. But then he said like, well, not everything is coming out of the test tube because we have a force. What force is that? That is called, this is what we call the atmospheric pressure the atmosphere exerts some pressure to us, to the table, to the ground, to the lakes, to the ocean, and that one is equivalent to a column of 760 millimeters of mercury. So he actually took a, a ruler and he measured the distance from the beginning of the pool to the maximum height of that column of mercury. He measured that and then he said like, oh, the atmospheric pressure is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. He called it millimeters of mercury because it's really a column of mercury, right? So, and the, it was kept like 760. That was, that is, remember, that is a sea level. At sea level is when we receive most of the, most of the, I mean, the pressure from the atmosphere. Okay. So also remember that when you are a different, uh, let me use the here, right? When you are like a sea level, right? So let's say like this one is the ocean. Okay. Let's say here you are at the ocean and then you are at the mountains, right? So somebody that is here receives the, the atmospheric pressure 
equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury because you are at sea level. What happens somebody that is here, that lives maybe in, in Denver, Colorado, you don't receive the 760 because you're receiving a less atmosphere. Let's say, I'm just gonna throw a number, I mean, I don't know exactly, but let's say here you receive 745 millimeters of mercury. So there is less pressure of, of, of air. If you, let's say like you go to the Everest, to the Himalayan, right? So now here you don't receive that much. You receive almost nothing. So let's say 720 millimeters of mercury. I mean, I don't know what is the pressure in the Himalayans, right? So I'm just drawing a number, 720. So that is why it's more difficult to breathe at higher altitudes. Why? Because there is no force. Remember, the pressure is really the measurement of how fast the air molecules, right? The air the air components, they hit the containers. In this case, our containers is our nose. The more the oxygen goes into your nose, the better you can breathe. Of course, if you are here, all the oxygen is running around because it is a lot of pressure. Oxygen, O2, will be running. So that you get the air into your nose, right? Um, let's say this is a nose. I know it doesn't look like a nose, but the air that it goes into your nose is way faster because the pressure is higher. What happens in a higher altitude? No, you don't have that anymore, right? So you have now less oxygen will go in because there is less pressure. The oxygen doesn't move that fast. And here obviously is worse. So the, the air, I mean, has no force. There is no pressure that you basically have like a really hard time trying to breathe because the oxygen doesn't really access, right, to, to your nose, right? So the best way how to, where, where to live is by the sea level. You have the highest breathing. That's why, as a, as a comment, um, let's say that you have the Olympics, right? Have you ever wondered why all the Olympics happen at sea level? For example, Tokyo is very close to the sea level. Sydney, Australia, in 2000, was also in, at the sea level. After Sydney was Athens, Greece was also at sea level. Next, that was 2008, that was, no, London was 2012, 2008, well, I don't remember. But that was, that was London, and then after that was Brazil, right? So have you ever wondered why all the Olympics, they always happen at the sea level? Not because they want to enjoy a, like a sunny day or, or a, a great weather because it's Summer Olympics. It's really because the athletes, they deserve to receive the same breathing conditions. Nobody would ever think of doing the Olympics in Nepal. I mean, no disrespect with Nepal. I mean, it's a beautiful country, but it's so high in altitude that you would ever think of doing that, right? or let's say in the rock, Rocky Mountains, you would never do that. So all the Olympics that happened in the US, the ones I recall is Los Angeles, right, 1984, then was Atlanta, uh, 1996. They are all very close to the sea level. So have you ever wondered that, I mean, why? Why they don't do it, let's say, in, in, in Dakota or on, on the Denver, Colorado, or, or it is because of the accessibility to oxygen at sea level. So you want your athletes to be at the same conditions. It would really be unfair to take you to the mountains to run, let's say like a hundred, right? Uh, like, uh, like a marathon or, or like a speed velocity competitions, even for swimmers. So it's not the same thing. So it's very important how to apply, I mean, all this gas concept for breathing. So the Olympics definitely is one of the application of the of the aroma uh, of the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so Torricelli he called uh, this atmospheric pressure. He put a, a, a well, then the chemist chemists they came out with this unit, but he said that okay, so I discovered that it is 760 millimeters of mercury, the atmospheric pressure. But since his last name was Torricelli, he put it, okay, so let's call, let's call it 760 Tor, because his last name was Torricelli. Okay. Torricelli was the scientist that this, I mean, was, did this study ring with, the, with the mercury, okay? So let's go back to the slides. Okay, so, <clears throat> 
uh, a barometer measures the atmospheric pressure. No, well, now nobody uses a, a, a mercury pool in the lab to measure the atmospheric pressure. Now they're all digital. I think even the cell phones, in some cases, they can determine the, 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 the atmospheric pressure. In the lab, uh, well, we, are not, uh, we have an instrument that measures temperature, barometric pressure, atmospheric pressure, and some other parameters, humidity. So now all these devices, they come all integrated in only one instrument, so we can get all the experimental parameters. Pressure is one of them. Manometer. Manometer is the one that you use for a pressure of a gas in a container. So, for example, if you want to know how inflated is uh, a basketball or a soccer ball, so definitely you need a manometer. As a manometer, right? Same thing for the gases. You want to double check that you have the appropriate uh, gas pressure in your tires, like in this picture is showing. So you use a manometer. Right? So barometer for atmospheric pressure and manometer for uh, gas in a container. They use similar, I mean, definitely the, uh, for tires you need higher pressure. You're not gonna tell, okay, I want my tire at three atmospheres. No, normally you use atmosphere for atmospheric pressure. Nobody says like, oh, my, my tire has only 3,000 millimeters of mercury. No, normally they use PSI, like Pascal's, it's also another, another unit. Um, but again, there are different different ways how to do the conversions. In chemistry, we deal with things in nature normally. I mean, the engineers, maybe engineering, you guys will go to the uh, to the plant, right, or to a specific tank to want to know. So in that case, you wouldn't use atmospheres, right? You would use pascals or maybe psi, depending. But here in the smaller scale for, for our course, general chemistry, we will use mostly atmospheres and, well, tors, right? Tors, which is also equal to, say, millimeters of mercury. Okay? So here are the conversion factors, right? If you want to convert atmospheres into tors, so you just have to multiply the atmospheres by the 760, right, constant. Okay? So that's how you do conversion. And if you want to do pascals, well, this is the other conversion factor for pascal, which is, a 101,325 to get Pascal's. Pascal's definitely is a larger, larger number. Okay. Let's go now and start with the gases, uh, the gas laws, Boyle, Charles, and Avogadro. And then this picture really resembles an ex, uh, one of them, which is the volume versus temperature. Right? You can see here there is a container that has, I guess, should be like dry ice or, or maybe liquid nitrogen. So that is extremely cold. The balloon, let's say that here I have a liter of gas. I put that balloon inside of the liquid nitrogen and now I can see that the gas shrinks, right? So now I have 0 0.2. If 0 0.2, I don't know how many, how what volume I have. If let's say 0 0.2 liters, what happened, right? I just decreased the temperature of the gas and then the, the balloon just shrunk, right? It went really small. So that is that follows the laws of Boyle, Charles, and Avogadro. They each of them they deal with different parameters. So what happened with the gas in the balloon? Well, you decrease the temperature and then the volume also decreased. That means that less temperature, lower temperature, lower volume. That is a correlation that we need to address in the laws. There is another one, which is, uh, for example, the in the case of the pistons, right? So what happens if you press a balloon? So you can shrink it, I mean, at some point. So more pressure, less volume. That's a different type of correlation. In the previous one was more volume, uh, sorry, less volume, less temperature. For pressure and volume would be more pressure, less volume would be inversely proportional, okay? So remember that laws, they don't really explain, right? To explain, you really need a theory. In laws, what you really mention is just a fact, which is an observation, right? So more, more temperature, more volume, more pressure, less volume. That's just a fact. It doesn't explain why. But for to explain, you need a theory. Okay, so for volume and temperature, that one, that example that you have with the, with the liquid nitrogen, what happened in the correlation between volume and temperature, in volume and temperature, you have that um, your observation, right? That particular experiment. The volume of the gas depends on the temperature of the gas, right? Did we change the pressure? Uh, no, right? How do you know that you didn't change the pressure? Because you were doing the same experiment in the same room. 
you cannot do an experiment at sea level and then the second half of the experiment on the top of the Everest, right? Or the, or the Rocky Mountains, because it has different pressures. I didn't see in that picture that they were applying any pressure. So they were only holding the balloon and there was no pressure change. And they didn't change the quantity of the gas. And I don't recall seeing in the picture that they opened the balloon to let some gas escape or they inflated more gas. No, there was nothing of that. So those are the parameters that we will study in gases. So re remember always pressure, volume, oops, that's a big P, temperature, and number of moles. Those are the four parameters that are, we are going to be using in gases. Pressure, volume, temperature, and moles. Those four parameters will change, but you cannot change them all at the same time. But why, why can I? Well, you can, but to understand these laws, we're gonna be changing only two at a time. That means that you will have a change in pressure and volume, which is the Boyle's law, volume and temperature, which is the Charles law. Is there any pressure and temperature? Yes, the pressure and temperature, that's the one that we are missing, the Gay-Lussac, the one that I was telling you at the beginning. Gay-Lussac studied the pressure versus temperature. And there was another one, which is the, the last one, Avogadro's. Avogadro's was changing volume with number of moles. So you have four different laws. We're only going to study three, Boyle, Charles, and Avogadro. But I just want you guys to know there is a fourth one, which is Gay-Lussac. Gay-Lussac, uh, he studied I mean, pressure and temperature. Okay, Boyle's law, the first one. Pressure and volume are inversely related, constant temperature, and constant number of moles, right, of gas. Uh, this, this process is called also um, isothermic. Isothermic means that it is at, 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 at the temperature remains unchanged. Okay? So volume and pressure, they don't, I mean, they, they're inversely proportional. If they are inversely proportional, that means that higher pressure, less volume less pressure, more volume, right? So, which makes sense. I mean, if you see, for example, some deodorants that come in a spray, all that gas is inside of that small container. As soon as you press, right, the top of the spray, you will see how the gas like, shh, like goes and escapes at a very incredible speed. Why? Because the gas is so compressed in that small container that as soon as it finds a door to escape, the gas will just expand. It will just try to fly. So from a smaller volume, right, you go to a larger volume. Inside of that container is a really large pressure. It's a lot of pressure inside. When you open the door, it goes to less pressure. If it goes to less pressure, less pressure that means that the gas will expand. It will go to a larger volume. That's why they recommend you guys that be very careful when you are like putting those containers in heat. Why? Because there is so much gas compressed in these containers that have the deodorants or the sprays that if you apply heat, it might explode. In the airplanes, they also recommend you like be careful. Be careful when you spray. I mean, don't have too much, too many like all these containers. Of course, the manufacturers, they know that. So they make sure that the spray containers, I mean, they are secure enough to handle the airplane changes in pressure in, and temperature because it's very cold, right, up there. So <clears throat> they, they come up with these security issues. I mean, that, that they, they, are, they assure that. But definitely do not, do not, uh, underestimate the effect of this container. Yes, it's a practical thing that you, the same thing happens. I mean, now that I'm talking about this topic, I mean, I, I really like to apply this to real cases. When you go to the airplanes, have you ever wondered why, um, let's say like I have my my toothpaste uh, top, right? The, the, the toothpaste. Um, it changes the shape. I don't know if you have noticed that. Or if I have like a moisturizer. Moisturizer, I see that it has a normal shape, but now when I get back to land, right? When I, when I after, I, I, after landing, I see that my moisturizer, the container has a different shape. I mean, it is not, it kind of, it kind of looks like deflated, right? So the, the reason is because you change pressure. At, at sea level, you have a one atmosphere of pressure. 
at that altitude, when the airplanes are, uh, are flying, uh, you have really no pressure, like 0 point, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 atmosphere of pressure is almost no pressure. Then the less pressure, more volume. So your, uh, your container is going to expand. But once you go back to land, then there is more pressure, then it will shrink again. So that's, that's what causes this changing in the shape of these plastic containers where we have, or whenever we fly, right? When you put your, your luggage in storage. So to understand the proportion between uh, pressure and volume, uh, Boyle came up with this particular law. So P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. So for this law, we're always going to use differences between initial and final. Okay? So this is the pressure and volume in the initial state. This is the pressure and volume in the final state. So you always want to address these laws, these three laws, the gas laws, as a comparison. You always have to compare. This one is my initial volume. This one is my initial pressure. Why, what will my final pressure be? What will my final volume be. So it's always a comparison between initial and final. Okay? This is an exercise. So let's start with the first uh, practice. It says like a sample of helium gas occupies 12.4 liters at 23 Celsius degrees and 0 0.956 atmospheres of pressure. What volume will it occupy at 1.20 atmosphere pressure? Assuming that the temperature stays constant, see you are in front of the of the Boyle's law. So stop that. So this particular problem. Remember that whenever you talk about gases, we are dealing with pressure, volume, temperature, number of moles. In this case, they want to find out the volume. So they say that the temperature is constant. Temperature is constant. There is no temperature change. And they, they don't say anything about the helium that they're letting escape. So we can always assume that the, that the number of moles is constant. So if this one is constant, this one is constant, we are dealing with PV. PV is Boyle's law. Boyle's law says that P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. Very similar to the dilution right, that we saw on chapter four, which is about Molarity one, volume one is equal to molarity two, volume two. Very similar formula, but really totally different concepts. Okay? So initially they say that I have helium 12.4 liters at 20, 23 Celsius degrees with this pressure. This one is my P1 and this one is my V1, right? because that's the initial state. What will be the final volume if now the pressure of this gas is at 1.2 atmosphere pressure? So initial pressure, 0 0.956 atmospheres, right? Times initial volume, 12.4 liters. Equal final pressure, 1.2 atmospheres. Final volume, that's what I want to know, right? Therefore, V2 would be equal to 0 0.956 atmospheres. 12.4 liters divided by 1.2 atmospheres, right? Atmosphere with atmospheres cancel out. So if I do my calculation, it would be 0.956 times 12.4 divided by 1.2, um, 9.88 liters, okay? Is there any unit limitation? No, there is no unit limitation. So as long as you're consistent, right? Consistent with your units, atmospheres, atmospheres, liters, liters, Okay. You can use millimeters of mercury, millimeters of mercury, um, gallons, gallons, right? Or, or pascals, pascals. So as long as you're consistent with the units, this, this problem should work perfectly without any complication, right? So let's see, 9.88 liters, right? As we calculated in our, our uh, practice. Charles Law, next one. Uh, now we're dealing with volume and temperature. This one has a limitation, right? So remember that whenever you use this particular uh, case, you have to remember always use the temperature in Kelvin, okay? And then these ones are actually directly correlated. That means that they, ha they are uh, directly, directly proportional. More volume, more temperature. Less volume, less temperature. We are assuming in this case that we have a constant pressure and a constant number of moles. 
So that's the proportionality constant. And then remember that, that the Kelvin will be equal to Celsius plus 273, right? So it's 273.15, but I mean, you can just use 273. Seven Kelvin is called the absolute zero. Yeah, that one we will check more on that uh, law in the thermodynamics. That's later when we study the next chapter, I think, is thermochemistry, right? which is going to be about temperature issues. So the Kelvin scale is the absolute scale. Uh, it goes all the way to zero. For example, in Celsius, you can have negative temperature. In Fahrenheit, you can also have ne negative temperature. In Kelvin, you never have negative, negative temperature. It's called the absolute zero. Even some animes, uh, Japanese animes, they work with absolute zero. It's the temperature is this, the lowest temperature ever reached uh, uh, that is allowed in nature. There is nothing below the zero Kelvin. Nothing, nothing. And just to give you an idea, liquid nitrogen, I think, is 70 Kelvin. So you're, you're even far from the zero Kelvin. Liquid helium is also very cold. I don't remember if it's 50 Kelvin. But you see, it's 50, 70 Kelvin. So no. Uh, room temperature is 297. So right now, we should be at 290, yeah, 297 Celsius uh, Kelvin degrees. 297 is far from the zero Kelvin, which is the absolute zero. This is the formula for uh, volume and temperature. This is one is the Charles law. Okay? Now the same thing: initial volume, final uh, initial temperature is equal to fi uh, final volume divided by final temperature. Let's do another exercise, very similar to the previous one. Suppose a balloon containing 1.30 liters of air at 24.7 Celsius degrees is placed into a beaker containing liquid nitrogen. Okay, the beaker contains liquid nitrogen, placed at uh, minus 78.5 78 Celsius degrees. What will be the new volume, right? A constant pressure. Okay, so this one is my seven, in second case, I have air. Uh, also, you can ask, oh, in the first case I had helium, now I have air. Is there any difference? No. Gases are gases. So it doesn't matter if you are working with oxygen gas, neon gas, helium gas, oxygen gas, nitrogen gas. Gases, they all behave the same. We will go over those rules in the theoret uh, molecular kine kinetics molecular theory. That is coming in a second. Right? So all gases behave the same. That's the beauty of this particular chapter is that they all get the same treatment. So air, even though it's a mixture, right? Because you would say that, oh, but air has oxygen, nitrogen. Uh, now with this greenhouse effect, now we can have some traces of carbon dioxide. Yes, we have all this. We have argon. Argon is one of the largest trace gases that we have in air. So it's a mixture. Oh, are they all the same? Can I treat them all the same? Yes, air is air. Air is a gas, gas is a gas. So there's, there's really no, no difference between the components of that mixture. Okay, so according to the law, I said like V1 divided by T1 is equal to V2 divided by T2. What was the limitation for the Charles law? Charles law, remember that we have to work with, you have to work with uh, Kelvin. So this temperature has to be converted to Kelvin. 24.7 plus 273, this is 97.7 Celsius degree, uh, Kelvin, right? Uh, what about this minus 78? Um, minus 78.5 plus 273. That is 194.5 uh, Kelvin. Oh, actually, liquid nitrogen is uh, minus 70 Celsius degrees. I think I told you before it was 70 Kelvin, right? No, it's minus 70 Celsius degrees, right? Minus 78 Celsius degrees, which is 194 Kelvin. Okay, so now that we have the volumes and the temperature, let's replace initial volume. My initial volume is 1.3 liters divided by initial temperature. My initial temperature is 297.7 Kelvin. Remember, always Kelvin. You will get a totally different result if you use Celsius. Don't use Celsius. Final volume, that's exactly what I want to find out. Final temperature is 194.5 Kelvin. Kelvin with Kelvin cancel out, therefore V2 is equal to 1.3 times 194.5 divided by 297.7. Okay. So the answer will be 
1.3 times 190 1.3 times 194.5 divided by 297.7 that's equal to say 0 0.85 what liters right why liters because i'm using here liters right remember units have to be consistent so 0 0.85 liters should be my answer for this particular problem let's see let's go back to the slides 0 0.85 yes liters right 0 0.845 remember no no sig fix for now on in this course so 0 0.85 should be an, an acceptable answer okay avogadro's law now we are working with volume and number of moles uh, are directly related that means that more volume involves more larger number of moles okay in this case n2v1 is equal to n2v2 can I flip them? Can I put V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2? Yeah, definitely, definitely. This is an exercise, right? So if 2.45 uh, 2 moles of argon gas occupies a volume of 89 liters, what volume will 2.1 mole of argon occupy under the same temperature and pressure conditions? Okay. Page is straightforward. Let's see. 2.95. The rule says uh, N1 V1 is equal to N2 V2, right? Here there is no restriction about temperature. Remember, the only restriction is the Kelvin units. So number of moles, initial number of moles, 290, 245 moles divided by initial volume, 89 liters, is equal to initial number of moles. Sorry, final number of moles, 2.1 moles divided by final volume. That's what I want to find out. Moles and moles cancel out. Therefore, V2 is equal to 2.1 times 89 divided by 2.45. My answer is going to be liters, of course, right? Because I'm using liters here. Um, 2.1 times 89 divided by 2.45, 76.5. 29 years. Okay. That would be the new volume. It used to be 89, now it shrinks, right? It, it makes sense because I have less moles, right? Less moles should occupy less, uh, should occupy less volume. 76.3, yeah, they round it even more. The Lial gas law. Okay, so after this loss of Boyle, Charles, and and Avogadro, even combining the gay lussacs right, which we haven't seen, which associates pressure and temperature. By the way, pressure and temperature will be in, uh, directly proportional. That means that more pressure, uh, more temperature, right? Very similar to the Avogadro's, right? Imagine like P1 over T1 would be equal to P2 over T2. That would be the gay lussac uh, gay lussacs law. So somebody thought of oh what if we put all these guys together like Boyle, Charles, Avogadro, Gay Lussac let's try to come up with one single law and that's exactly what they did they say like uh, volume and temperature that is Charles law right volume and number of moles that is Avogadro's law volume and pressure that was Boyle's law what happens if we combine all these ones, right? I mean, you can you can have all these there, right? Volumes. What happens if we combine them? Well, we come up with this formula, which is PV is equal to NRT. Okay. So now, what is my new constant? My new constant is this R. The R is the idea. R is the gas constant. Is the universal gas constant. Always remember it. And then I'm sure that from now on you will remember that value forever. 0.082. I still remember it since I took it in high school. I mean, it is 0.082 liter atmosphere more Kelvin. That's the unit that applies to gases only. Okay. That R constant is always will be also used in Chem 2, not necessarily for gases, for other things, but it is taken from this law. So the R constant is really the combination of all these constants, this B constant, this A constant, and this K constant. The proportionality constants of these parameters. So PVNRT pressure times volume is equal to number of moles times the 
universal gas constant, and the temperature. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. Oh, one more thing. Pay attention to the units of the R. The units of the R, right, the constant R, uh, will tell you the, the units that you have to use. For example, for pressure. I know that for pressure, you can have Pascal, millimeters of mercury, atmospheres, uh, PSI, tors. Which one should I use? Well, the R constant is telling me use atmospheres. So I have to make sure that whenever I use this formula, and I, I'm planning on using this R, 0 0.082, I have to make sure that my pressure is in atmospheres. What about volumes? Can I use gallons? Can I use uh, milli, milli, milliliters or deciliters? No. According to the R constant, it's telling you that you have to use liters. Same thing for moles, while well, moles, the only is only moles. Well, that's no problem. And temperature, you have to use Kelvin. So whenever you use this ideal gas law equation, make sure that you have liters, atmospheres, and Kelvin. And if you don't have them, you have to convert them to, this, to those units. Okay, exercise. An automobile uh, tire at 25, 23 Celsius degrees with an internal volume, internal volume of 25 liters is filled with air to a total pressure of 3.18 atmospheres. Determine the number of moles, right, of air in the tire. Okay. That's this problem, this exercise. They gave me the temperature, the volume, the pressure, the number of moles. How do I know that I don't have to use the P uh, boils, right? Or this one, Avogadro's? Because if you see here, they are comparing an initial versus a final. And that's what we've been doing also in this particular problem. You had an initial versus a final. What about here? Same thing. You had an initial versus final. In the ideal gas law problems, you don't have initial and finals. There is only one state, right? There is no initial final, there is no two versions. They will not give you two temperatures, they will not give you two volumes, they will not give you two pressures. Here, yes, here they gave you two moles, right? That's a comparison. Here, you don't have a comparison. So I will use here PV and RT. Uh, my R is 0 0.082, atmospheres liter, mole Kelvin. Okay. Do I have my pressure in atmospheres? Yes. Do I have my volume in liters? Yes. Do I have my moles? Well, moles is my unknown. Do I have my temperature in Kelvin? No. Okay, so that temperature, 273 plus 273, that's equal to 296 Kelvin. Now I'm, now I'm all set. Okay. PV is equal to NRT. If I solve on N, that would be equal to say PV divided by RT. Right? N would be equal to pressure. What's my pressure? 3.18 atmospheres. B, 25 liters, divided by R, 0.082 atmospheres, liter, mole, Kelvin. Right? Temperature, 296 Kelvin. Atmosphere with atmospheres cancel out, liters with liters cancel out, Kelvin with Kelvin cancel out. What is left? Moles, right? Therefore, N is equal to 318 ti uh, 3.18 times 25 divided by 0 0.082 divided by 296. This one would be equal to 3.28 moles of air. That would be my final answer. That's how we use the PVNRT, the DL gas law. Right? Once again, we will have way more problems, right? For the solved problems, I will be recording in YouTube. 3.27, 0 0.28, yeah, maybe some decimal places. Another exercise, what is the pressure? What is the pressure in a 3.304.0 liter tank? that contains 5.67 kilograms of helium at 25 Celsius degrees, right? All right, what is the pressure if I have uh, 5.67 kilograms of helium at 25 Celsius degrees? 
here I'm using definitely the PV and RT. How do I know that? Because I'm not comparing anything, right? So I'm getting one single pressure, sorry, one single volume, one single mass, one single temperature, PV and RT. Uh, according to the R is atmosphere liter mole Kelvin. Right? I have to double check that I have all of them. Do I have volume? Yes, right? I have the volume. Uh, is it in liters? Yes. Temperature, is it in Kelvin? No, I have to change that to Kelvin. 25 plus 273, 298 Kelvin. I'm all set, good. Do I have moles? No, I don't have moles. I have kilograms. I have to convert this into kilograms. How do I get, uh, sorry, into moles? By definition, number of moles is equal to mass divided by molar mass, right? Okay, so kilograms, normally we don't use kilograms, right? It has to be grams. So 5.67, so that will be equal to 5,770 grams of helium divided by the molar mass of helium. What is the molar mass of helium? Well, we need to bring the periodic table. The periodic table says that the mass of helium is four. Okay, divided by four grams per mole. So five seven five six seventy divided by four that's equal to one thousand four hundred seventeen point five moles of helium, right? So I have the moles. Right? Do I have the pressure? No, that's my question mark. Do I have the volume? Yes, the three hundred and four. Do I have the number of moles? Yes, fourteen hundred seventeen. Uh, R is a constant temperature. Yes. Okay. So I'm all set. So uh, they want me pressure, pressure will be equal to NRT divided by volume, number of moles, 1417.5 moles, R, 0 0.082, atmosphere, liter, mole, Kelvin, temperature, temperature is 298 Kelvin, divided by volume, volume is three or four liters. Right. Mole with mole cancel out, Kelvin with Kelvin cancel out, liters with liters cancel out. What is left is atmospheres. Let's see, 1417.5 times 0 0.082 times 298 divided by 3 or 4, 113, wow, that's a lot of pressure, 113.95 atmospheres, right? Yeah, one one hundred and fourteen atmospheres. This is a lot. It's a lot of it's a lot of pressure. Imagine if if atmospheric pressure is only one atm. Imagine one hundred and fourteen atms. Yeah, definitely a lot of pressure. Yep. So here is another one. Uh, what temperature? That's. I mean, we will do more of these problems later. I mean, in the YouTube videos, I will be posting the videos as always. Right. So for this particular chapter. At what temperature does 121 liters, milliliters of carbon dioxide occupy volume pressure? Okay, let me see. At what temperature does 121 milliliters of carbon dioxide and 1.05 atm Occupy a volume of 297 milliliters of pressure, milliliters of volume at a pressure of 1.40 atm. Right? Okay, so in this particular problem, let's uh, let me. See, at what temperature, right, will occupy, at what temperature this 121 milliliters of carbon dioxide and 1.05 atm uh, will occupy a volume of 293 and a pressure of 1.40 atmosphere of pressure. So here they're giving me two volumes. So what is the meaning for that? Uh, well, they are really telling me that 
the they want to find out the temperatures, right? So in this particular case, uh, so in this problem we have to it's a comparison, right? Because you see that here I cannot use the PV and RT, right? Because remember in the PV and RT we have uh, only one single temperature, one single volume, one thing is only only once. But here they're telling me at what temperature, right? Is this particular sample 27 Celsius degrees, right? So I have initially my gas, which has 121 milliliters of carbon dioxide, which is at 1.07 atmospheres and at 27 Celsius degrees. At what temperature will I have this gas, but now occupying 293 milliliters with a pressure of 1.40 atmospheres of pressure? Right? So it's a change. They want to know what temperature you can have this, this particular change of the, right, of the conditions. So there is one more law is that combines, it was not part of the slides, but the laws can be combined into this combined gas law. This one is called the combined gas law. P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2, V2 over T2. Right? It combines all the laws. Here you have the Gay-Lussac, P over T. Here you have the Boyce law. And here you have the Charles law, okay? See, if you would see P1B, P1T1. Okay? Here's Boyce law, and here will be the Gay-Lussac law, P1T1, okay? So you can combine that, it's a comparison. I need to use any of the uh, gas laws. So let's see. Uh, remember that whenever you use these gas laws, the temperature has to be in Kelvin. Okay? Uh, 27 Celsius degrees is equal to say 300 Kelvin. Okay, so initial pressure 105, sorry, 110, 1.05 atmospheres. Initial volume 121 milliliters. Milliliters, there is no part of milliliters. Uh, initial temperature 300 Kelvin. Equal. Initial uh, final pressure 1.4 atmospheres. Final volume 293 milliliters. Final temperature that's exactly what I want to, I want to find out. So atmospheres with atmospheres cancel out milliliters. So I'm going to be left with Kelvin. T2 will be equal to. Let me see. 1.4 times 293 times 300 divided by 121 divided by 1.05. Temperature will be equal to 968.6 Kelvin, which will be equal to 695.6 Celsius degrees. Okay? So that will be my temperature because they want me to find out what is the temperature in Celsius, right? So 695.6 Celsius degrees. Okay. So let's see what they say here. Okay, so 696, very close. I got 695.6. Right, so let's continue. Gas stoichiometry. In gas stoichiometry, what we have, well, we also can do the equation, but here really it is a comparison. Uh, one mole of an ideal gas, right, at zero Celsius degrees and one atmosphere of pressure occupies 22.42 liters. That's very important also. One mole of gas at STPs, STPs is that zero Celsius degrees and one atmosphere pressure. What is STP? STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature is zero Celsius degrees. That's for gases. And the standard pressure is one atmosphere of pressure. Okay? So STP is zero, zero, zero Celsius degrees and one atmosphere of pressure. Any gas, right? Any ideal gas occupies 22.42 liters. Okay? You can get that from the PVNRT equation. That's how they got that 22.4. I mean, it's really not a law. It's really not. It's, it's not that. It is just they are they are putting the atmosphere here, like right? one atmosphere, and here they use zero, zero Celsius degrees, which is 273.2, and then they found out that that's the volume that it occupies any gas. TP, okay? Therefore, the molar volume is 22.42, right? 
exercise. A sample of oxygen gas has a volume of 2.50 uh, liters of STP. How many grams mass of oxygen? Uh, present. All right. So, all right. So I have 2.50 liters of oxygen, right, at STP conditions. I know that the one mole of any gas occupies 22.42 uh, liters, right? One mole of any gas. In the case of oxygen, what is the molar? What is the molar mass of oxygen? Well, the molar mass of oxygen is well, oxygen 16, but I have two is 32 grams per mole. So that means that one mole weighs 32 grams. So 32 grams of oxygen occupy 22.4 liters, 42 liters. I want to know now 250, right? So in the case I have two 2.50 liters times, I know that for oxygen, right? For this I use, I use the molar mass, right? For oxygen, um, 32 grams of oxygen occupy 22.42 liters. Liters with liters cancel out, therefore 2.5 times 32 divided by 22.42, that's 3.57 grams of oxygen. Right? What is the mass of oxygen? It's 3 grams 50, 57. Right? Three point fifty-seven grams exactly. Molar mass of a gas. Uh, you can get that from. Uh, it's really is decomposing the, the the equation. Uh, we can we can deduce this one here. We we even have density. Okay, so. <clears throat> um, we can deduce that. For example, we know that PV is equal to nRT. Right, but at the same time, we know that N is equal to mass divided by molar mass, right? So if we replace that, PV is equal to mass divided by molar mass times RT. So you want to find out the molar mass of a given gas, molar mass to be equal to mass times R times T divided by V times T, right? So that's another way how to write the PV and RT based on molar mass. So you can get the molar mass of a sample, of a gas sample, just by using PV and RT. Even one more. This one, M divided by V, we know that density is equal to mass over volume. So this one can even be replaced. So that molar mass will be equal to density times RT divided by pressure. Okay? So from uh, PV and RT, which is the ideal gas law, you can also get the molar mass and you can even get the density, the density of a, of a gas. And the density is gonna be in gas per liter. Okay? So remember that that's the only difference that normally we, we write density as grams per milliliter, but that's for liquids. Uh, gases are way lighter. So the density would be expressing gas per, per liter, not per milliliter. Okay? So that's what it is about this equation the one that we have in this particular slide, density of the gas, temperature in Kelvin, right, our constant, mm, that's, that's something we're gonna be using constantly. Exercise, so we have, what is the density of fluorine at STP, right? In, in, in grams per liter, density of fluorine, F2. Okay? So for this particular problem, well, uh, we will have to bring that, they want the density, right? I'll use this formula, right? Density, molar mass, therefore density will be equal to molar mass times pressure divided by RT, right? If I, if I want to solve from density, so density is equal to molar mass times pressure divided by RT. They tell me at STP, right? STP is zero Celsius degrees, which is equal to 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere of pressure. Okay. Density, molar mass, molar mass of fluorine, fluorine, each fluorine is 19, right? You see, fluorine, 19, 18.99, 19. 19 times two, 
38 grams per mole. Okay, so 38 grams per mole times the pressure, pressure is one atmosphere, divided by R, 0 0.082 atmosphere liter mole Kelvin times the temperature, temperature 273 Kelvin. Right? Uh, mole with mole cancel out, Kelvin with Kelvin cancel out, atmosphere with atmosphere cancel out. What is left? Grams per liter, which is exactly density. Right? Yeah, if I solve here, that would be 38 divided by 0 0.082 and also divided by 273, 1.69, yeah, 1.7 almost, 1.7 grams per grams per liter in this particular problem. And let's how we check. 1.7, yeah, grams per liter. Okay. Again, we will have more problems later. Dalton's law of partial pressure. In this particular uh, Dalt uh, Dalton, he analyzed the, what is the mixture, right? What happens now when we don't have one single gas? What happens if I combine in gas, right? I have, a, I have two tanks and then I bridge those tanks. What would be the final, right? The final pressure. So you combine, let's say that you have pressure one, pressure two, pressure three, they all get combined. Mm -hmm. Exercise, consider the following apparatus containing helium in both sides. It's helium, so while uh, initially the valve is closed, after the valve is open, what is the pressure of the helium gas? Well, it would be, since it's helium, so they will be additive, right? Because one is at two atmospheres, the other one is at three atmospheres. Now uh, it would be a different, uh, it's two, I mean, they behave as, Gases are the same, so they will have a different uh, here. This this one is actually better. We can do that, but this next one is exactly the same, the same problem. By opening the gas valve, is it going to yeah, are they going to add? Well, they have different volumes, right? So the volume will definitely change the the proportion. So in this case, I have two atmospheres. at night ATMs, right? And then I have three atmospheres at three liters, right? Sorry, nine liters. Just writing quickly. Okay. Okay. In this particular problem, I have this, right? What would be the final pressure? So I will call this gas A, and I will call this gas B. I know that they are both helium, but in right now, I'm just calling calling gas A and gas B. Yeah, I know they are the same. So what happens with A? A initially is at two atmospheres. The initial volume is nine liters. What happens if I open the valve? If I open the valve, now everything is going to be nine and three, 12, 12 liters. What is gonna be the final pressure? I don't know. Right? I'm just doing on A. So B1, 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 B1 is equal to B2, B2, right? That's because I want to find out what will be the final pressure of this A gas. So B2 would be equal to B1, B1 divided by B2. Uh, B1 will be two atmospheres. Volume one is nine divided by final volume, 12. 18 divided by 12, 1.5. That's the new pressure of A. The new pressure of A went from two to 1.5. Now I do the same thing for B. What is the initial pressure of B? Three atmospheres. What is the initial volume of B? Uh, of B, right, three liters. What is the final pressure? I don't know. What is the final volume? Also 12 liters, right? Because this gas went from three liters, now to occupy 12 liters. So P2 is equal to P1, B1 divided by B2. Remember, I'm working on B right now, right? Gas B. So uh, final initial pressure and volume, three times three divided by 12, uh, three, four, 
three fourths will be 0 0.75, right? Yeah. Atmospheres, right? So now the final pressure of PA would be equal to 1.5 atmospheres. The final pressure of PB would be 0 0.75 atmospheres. What would be the total? It would be 2.25, right? According to Dalton's law, right? Total pressure would be equal to P1, in this case, PA plus PB. My PA is 1.75 and my PB is 0 0.75. But why can I just add three, two plus three? No, you cannot add two plus three. You say like, oh, my final, my, my total pressure should be five atmospheres. No, because remember this gas is not in nine liters anymore. This gas will be in 12 liters. So in 12 liters, you cannot expect this gas to keep that two atmospheres. Same thing here. Here is under three atmospheres. Yeah, it's three atmospheres if you keep it as three liters. But once you open this, this valve, this gas will not be a three, three atmospheres, it will be a less because you have now 12 liters. And so that's what happened with this particular problem. Similar is the next one, um, the next exercise. Actually, I was planning on doing this one. Um, it's exactly the same case. Uh, you have the oxygen and then you have helium. They have different temperature, uh, sorry, uh, pressure and volume. And then you have to find out what is the partial pressures and the total new pressure, right? If you do the exactly the same thing that I did in the previous example, you will find these values. Okay. The kinetic molecular theory gas. Okay, so <clears throat> this theory uh, really talks about like what is what is it about gases, right? What makes gases so special? The first possibility of this theory of gas is that particles of gas are so small. So uh, right from the very first diagram I show you that the gas are too far away from each other. So there's a large distance between gas particles. And so compared to the distance between them. So you can say that the volume of the particle is zero because there is so much empty space that the volume of the particles is almost ne negligible. So you can say that it's zero. That's, that's not what happens in the solid or liquid phase, right? In this case, solid liquid phase, you can see that the particles are tightly packed. So they are really they're very close to each other. The second postulate is that the particles are in constant motion, right? So those collisions uh, are supposed to be elastic, uh, but they cause the pressure, right? So gases, they are, always moving and then they hit the water of the container and that creates uh, what we call pressure. Third is that they are not exerting forces to each other. So normally we know that if you have water, water molecules, they have some forces that they attract to each other. So in the case of gases, these forces are ignored. So for example, if a nitrogen gas meets another nitrogen gas, there is no attraction, no repulsion, right? So they do not attract, they do not repel. Remember, this one is for um, ideal gases. The average kinetic energy of a, uh, of a, of a gas particle is assumed to be direct, directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature, yes. So um, a gas particle will move faster if you apply more heat, right? So that is, uh, that is the aerostatic, aerostatic balloons, right? So, you have to apply heat. You cannot, I mean, I wish I could, I mean, maybe one of my next uh, trips, I would like to go to Turkey. I know that, uh, or some other country, they have these balloons, right? And then they, they circulate deserts, right? Those balloons, and then you just have like a balloon ride. That should be very beautiful. So they are all based on fire. So it has, you have to heat up the gas to make it move. So really that heat is what transfers the energy to the gas particles and the gas particles, they start moving, right? Why? Because the kinetic energy starts to increase. If they increase, that means that the, the gas also, I mean, the velocity of the particles is going to increase. And so the gas particles will move more rapidly if you increase the temperature, okay? Concept check. Okay, so now based on these principles, let's see what happens. So what happened with different and same, right? So assuming that we have two balloons, one with helium and one with hydrogen gas, right? So they have the same volume. Complete each of the following statements with different or the same. Okay, the pressure of the gas in the two balloons are the same. They are the same. Why? Because you have the same volume. 
assuming that both balloons are at the same pressure, uh, at the same temperature and, and, and the same number of moles, remember that you will have the same number of moles because according to Avogadro's law, um, constant volume will have also constant number of moles, right? So one mole of gas will occupy 22.4. So assuming that they have the same volumes, that means that they also have the same number of moles. Same number of moles, same number of volume, same temperature should also be same number of, uh, same pressure, same pressure. What about temperature? Well, if they have the same volume and the same number of moles, they also have the same temperature. There is no temperature change according to the kinetic molecular theory of gases. What about number of moles? They yeah, are constant. They are the same because you are not letting escape. One mole of gas occupies 22.4. If these two balloons have the same volume, definitely they have the same number of moles. What about the density? Yeah, that's different. A balloon of helium is not going to weight the same as a balloon of hydrogen, even though they have the same volume. Volume is not a representation of the mass. Mass is historically different for volume. So in this case, density is going to be different. Density is different because a particle of helium weights different from a, from a particle of hydrogen. They might occupy the same volume, but they don't have the same mass, right? Let's sketch a graph of pressure versus, uh, that's the graph for, for, the, for the Boyle's law. Um, this one has more or less this shape. Here you have pressure, and here you have volume. It is inversely proportional so the inversely proportional graph would be more or less like this so more volume less pressure right more pressure less volume so that more or less with the graph for a pressure versus volume what about volume versus temperature yeah more more volume more temperature right so that means that the graph volume versus temperature should be like this, a straight line climbing up, right? That's for one gas, right? If you want another gas, definitely they have different curves, right? Not all the gas in the can be said, yeah, something like that, right? A straight line, I'm supposed, it's supposed to be a straight line. Same thing for volume versus temperature, right? In Kelvin, the previous one was with Celsius, right? Now when it will be with Kelvin, it will be exactly the same. The only difference is that now the temperature will be in Kelvin. Same thing with volume versus moles. More moles, more volume. So it should be a very similar graph, similar to this, to this one that we just did, this one. But now you will have volume, right, versus moles here. It's exactly the same graph. It's a straight, straight chain, a straight, straight line. Okay, now let's talk about uh, real gases. We're close to the end. In the case of real gases, uh, you must correct the non-ideal gas behavior when or when are we in front of a real gas, when the pressure of the gas is high. So if you have a really high right, uh, gas, like a really high pressure gas, then what happens with the particles? Now the particles will get close to each other. Right? So that's what happens, let me see. In the ideal gas law, right, we were saying that these guys will not be, right? The probability that they find to each other is really small. That is in the ideal gas law. So, but what happens if you apply pressure or you reduce the volume? You will have those four particles very close. So what are the chances that this gas will find the other gas? Now the chances are going to be very high, right? These possibilities versus this possibility. The more higher pressure or smaller volume, right, which is the, is the same thing, right, say. Now, in the case of the real gases, right, now they will find to each other. If they find to each other, they will be undergoing some attraction or repulsion forces. That one has to be considered in the real gas. So ideal gas assumes that they don't see each other, never. Why? Because they are so diluted, right? There is so much inter interparticle space that the probability that they will find each other is very small, always almost zero. 
But if you increase the pressure, that possibility increases exponentially. So that means that these particles now will have high chances to see each other. What happens if they see to each other? Then they will be attracting. Maybe they two will form a pair, right? So that's exactly what happens in the, in the real gas law. In the real gas law, now we have when the pressure is high, those collisions or that the two particles get, to, get close to each other, now they increase. If the temperature is low, the same thing. Why? Because the particles will move so slowly. If they move slowly and they find each other, since they are moving so slowly, they will have more chances to interact, to attract or to repel. So that's also a condition for temperature. Okay? So under these conditions, concentration of gases, particles is high, right? Because pressure, more pressure, more higher concentration, and the attractive forces become important. So this is what happens, for example, for uh, the PV NRT, they use for real gases, right? It should be a straight line. As it says here, for example, uh, an ideal gas law. Ideal gas should be a straight line here, right in the horizontal. But if you go to hydrogen, for example, hydrogen still has like a straight line behavior, like here, like that green line, right? What happened with nitrogen? Oh, nitrogen is kind of ideal at low pressure, but as soon as you increase the pressure, look at nitrogen, goes up, 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 deviates greatly from the ideal gas behavior. Carbon dioxide is far from the behavior from the very beginning. Methane the same, right? So <clears throat> those are the considerations that we have, we need, right? So here, a hydrogen, nitrogen gas, the same gas at three different temperatures. So the, the behaviors change greatly. So the Van der Waals equation now includes some some um, changes, right? So here is supposed to be P, V, and R, T. Right, that's NRT. So in the case for the real gas, the pressure expression changes. Now this one is gonna be the observed pressure and then we include one factor, one parameter, a factor, correction factor. Same thing for volume. Volume will include one conversion factor, okay? So that would be the corrected pressure. Now it's in the case of a, uh, in the case of uh, a real gas law. Okay? Characteristic of real gases are uh, here, there are some, um, like the gases here are like the parameters, the A and the B. Where are these A and B? These A and B are coming from these parameters, right? The here it would be the A, Let me get this thing. This A parameter and this B parameter. N is number of moles, of course. Okay. So and then we have a table. So they have tabulated all that, all the A and B values for uh, all the all the gases. Okay. So are we gonna use that? Um, So, are we going to be using this particular table? I mean, are we going to be calculating the number of, uh, I mean, the A and the B values? Not really, right? So, for this particular case, we are not. I mean, it's just for us to know, right? Okay? So, what we are, um, just what means the real gas, okay? But the fact that we're going to be using really this equation, like, putting in the parameters, um, not really. I mean, we're not gonna be using. So all I want you guys to know is that the real gas law, right? Why is it different from the ideal gas law, okay? But you can see that every, every particular gas has its own A and B parameters, right? So I think that would be it for this chapter. Uh, please keep an eye on the, on the solve problems, my other videos. Thank you.